Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Brain Club. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm the executive director of All Brains Belong, and we're really glad you're here. Let me share screen and get us oriented. Um, so tonight is our book chat. Uh, this time we're actually going to do we're going to do a two in one. We're going to have a book chat on The Rainbow Brain by Sandra Menon, as well as We're Not Broken by Eric Garcia. And um, as as per always, we have no expectation of anyone for having read or listened to the book. That's uh, how we do book chats is we um, we watch some video clips and we read some excerpts and um, optional reflections from 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 that which which we share. OK. Um, this has been um, a whole month theme on learning and unlearning, although arguably that's the theme of Brain Club every month. <laughs> um, so uh, if, if you're new to Brain Club, what is this? This is our education program for purposes of teaching the public um, about All Brains Belong's approach to neuroinclusive community culture. And it's a way of like pulling back the curtain to model um, the culture of some of our other programs. Um, and with the idea that what, what hopefully what you experience here, you, um, if you like it, you can then go out into the world and carry it forward. And that's how we change systems. What we hope for all of you, um, whether it's your first spring club or if you've been coming for years, um, we expect that um, this is a place to feel safe. It's a place to experience how culture can be different and a place to collectively learn and unlearn. Um, this is not a place for medical or mental health advice. It's also not a support group. This is an education program only. So um, I just want to uh, review um, these couple of things that we show every week. Um, these are uh, community agreement that come from our community advisory board about uh, what, what is part of queuing safety at an education program. So it's a place um, where, again, you're here to explore the big picture theme, and you can share ideas or reflections related to the educational topic, but it's not a place to make personal requests or to address personalized needs or personalized problem solving like you would do in a support group, because this is not a support group. And it's not the right place to solicit or recruit for other programs. Other than that, all paths to participation are welcome here. You can have the video on or off. Even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. Um, we certainly don't need you to sit still or look at the camera or any of those neuronormative constructs. So please feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat or take breaks. Um, and uh, though we welcome you to ask questions or make comments, um, observation is also a completely valid form of participation. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, one of the things that is, um, you know, uh, that, 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 that uh, many people don't don't experience um, everywhere is this is a space where we prioritize the group's needs over that of any one individual. Uh, speaking of needs, uh, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can also do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And uh, that's my visual support to make sure I have the chat open, which I do for a change. Um, so speaking of the chat, um, we often have conflicting access needs, meaning many people have, you know, we all have different brains, different brains have different needs, and um, inevitably, um, often those needs conflict. And so the chat is a place where that happens, you know, often. So for many people, it is a, the chat is a place to be able to communicate without mouth words. Um, it allows for more processing time, more people can share ideas. Um, so for some people, it's like a cognitive fidget, which allows like it, it, it supports being able to focus and process some of the things on the main screen. But for other people, the chat is uh, it's visually cluttered. It's distracting. Some people have startle responses to pop ups, especially when the things are moving like really fast. And lately, especially as Brain Club has gotten bigger, um, our staff are finding the chat difficult to manage lately. So we just want to name 
um, that we want to we, we, we want to just keep the chat to be something that's still available for people to be able to access. And there may be some things that maybe aren't, you know, maybe, maybe they're not things that people talk about a lot of the time. So did you know that many brains need more processing time? And so if the chat is like flooded and moving really quickly, um, many brains can't process the ideas being shared by the people who are typing. There are also um, many people who have the kind of brain who actually can't enter the typing conversation if others are typing. So again, like the same way that we would give space with mouth words to enter a conversation, we also want to give space in the chat. And as I mentioned, um, you know, there's a, a lot of a lot of brains that have responses to the chat being moving too quickly, um, or even chat messages that are really emotionally charged um, or, or emotionally demanding. So um, we just want to just recognize that in neuroinclusive culture, we want to give space for everyone to participate in their own way. Thank you. Um, the one thing we do ask about, if you are going to use the chat, we ask that you please use the big box instead of using um, reply threads, because when the reply thread actually makes the chat bounce, and there's many people who can't access the chat when the chat is bouncing. Um, and of course, um, just like just like we would with mouth words, um, if you've shared a lot already, just give others a turn. Um, one thing I just want to mention is that it was really lovely to see many of you, whether in person um, or uh, hanging out on, on in virtual land for our third annual Community Health Education Fair this weekend. Um, we had a lot of fun and um, it was really, really exhausting for like six months that led up to this. So um, I do want to make an announcement and thank you, Martha, for, uh, for bringing that up in the chat. Uh, Brain Cub will not meet in September. Um, there were many other programs that had to take a back seat um, so that our so that a small a small part time community staff can pull off an event of the size and scale of the community health education fair. Um, so uh, those programs, uh, uh, they require more attention than usual this month. So um, after tonight, Brain Club will resume October 1st, which is usual Tuesday, 6 p.m. time. But in the meantime, we have about three hours worth of programming for you to enjoy, new programming. So I'm gonna put the link in the chat and this will also go out by, actually it, it, for anybody who registered for Brain Club tonight, this already went out, but it'll go out again when the recording from tonight gets sent out. So um, what you'll find there is you'll find um, musical performances as well as um, our two hour community storytelling. Um, so community storytelling um, was basically brain club, but five topics, um, shorter 20 minute presentations on things from healthcare to employment to communication and, uh, and long COVID. And we invite you to check that out. Um, and we look forward to seeing you back in October. Um, all right, that's my visual support. You remember to put the link in and I've done that. All right, great. Um, so on to our book chat. So um, what these books have in common, um, at least what our staff thought, is that these are books that relate to the theme of changing your story, changing your self-narrative. I think what we see often is that um, uh, neurodivergent folks get the message, both explicitly and implicitly, implicitly um, that the way that we fundamentally are as people the way we experience the world, the way we communicate, the way we play, the way we think, the way we learn, that fundamentally it's broken and needs changing or fixing or, you know, need to in some way comply or get stuffed into containers, even though the containers don't work for us. And that over time takes a toll on many people. Um, and um, that that is bad for health. Um, and so the first book we're going to take a, a, a closer look at is called We're Not Broken, Changing the Autism Conversation by Eric Garcia. And I will put a link in the chat to Eric Garcia's website for anybody who wants to check out the book or more information about the author. Um, but Eric Garcia is an autistic journalist. Um, senior Washington correspondent for uh, the publication The Independent. 
previously has written for the Washington Post, The Hill, Roll Call, National Journal, and Market Watch. Um, and uh, what this book is, um, is about is many different examples about shifting the autism narrative. And we talk about these things at Brain Club all the time. Um, let's watch this video. I'm going to stop share and reshare. No, I'm not gonna do that. I should minimize my screen first. So I'm modeling how I cope with my dyspraxia. All the steps that have to get done in an order, I find exhausting. All right, I'm gonna share sound. I'm gonna reshare and now make my volume louder. I hear I think the most important thing to recognize is that plenty of And like, of course, I played the wrong video in the wrong order. We are going to watch that one, but we're going to watch this one first. What I would say to parents who feel that autism can be fixed is we do not tell children in wheelchairs that they need to walk. We do not tell deaf children that they need to learn how to hear or they need a culture. Uh, we don't tell blind children that they need to see. But for some reason, when it comes to developmental disabilities, we assume that we need to change or alter them in order for them to deserve an education, in order for them to deserve being treated as a human being. And I think what we need to say is that autistic people are fully formed human beings as is. They are not partially human and that being autistic is part of them. It's not something that afflicts them. It defines how they see and live and interact with the world. Just today on my way to the office, I'm in New York City right now. And I had to think about how do I get to the office? How do I deal with all the stimuli going on with the sound of the car horns and cars whizzing by and people walking past me? Uh, it is an integral part in my day. I think about it constantly with how I move and interact with the world. So in the same way, I am asking able-bodied people and able-minded people to keep autistic people in mind and be understanding and accepting um, because that takes oddly enough a lot less work than trying to change autistic people. So why does the Zoom t task bar disappear all the time? It just disappears. Anyway, um, yeah, I think that message is, you know, we talk about that at Brain Club all the time. And I think that um, what what is interesting and helpful about this book, which is written for an audience um, of, 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 I mean, a wide audience, but, but uh, one of the audience types includes people who have never thought about this stuff before. And so um, I think that a message of a, you know, a high profile person, um, you know, being able to name those things um, about daily life things that many people take for granted. Um, while I was watching that, that reminded me, uh, I don't know if that would resonate with anybody, but the microwave, like, reach the end of its 30 seconds at the same time that the oven reached target temperature. And so like they both beeped, but like slightly off, um, slightly off tempo. It was, uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I thought about how many, how many people in our village might resonate with how, un, how, how awful that was. Um, but that's not all this book is about. So in this book, um, Mr. Garcia discusses examples of systems that were not designed with autistic people in mind. Um, and this may look familiar, healthcare, education, most workplace environments, um, but also addresses um, you know, the intersectionality of all of the different aspects of identity, 
um, that all stack up um, intersectional privilege versus intersectional marginalization or, or oppression. Um, so if you're autistic and marginalized for race or gender or class or employment status, or if you're autistic and are socially isolated, and you combine multiples of these um, aspects of identity, um, and we're going to watch a video clip uh, where he talks about that. Presence of mind to leave the box checked. I did. Okay. I think the most important thing to recognize is that plenty of autistic people of color go undiagnosed or get misdiagnosed. Plenty of black autistic children are misdiagnosed as having a behavioral disorder. And if you're misdiagnosed as having a behavioral disorder, then schools are going to treat you differently. And they're not going to give you the same kind of uh, services that maybe a white presenting child might have. In the same respect, a lot of there's uh, a lot of the diagnostic criteria is still delivered with white male autistic children in mind. So as a result, a lot of children from English as a second language homes are uh, avoided. On top of that, plenty of girls are you know overlooked or people who are assigned female at birth, they're often overlooked. And I think that uh, often prevents them from getting the right services that they need. And on top of that, I think because for a long time, we tend to think of autistic traits as something that boys ha uh, have. When it comes to girls, if they're quiet or they're not as socially interactive, we tend to think of, oh, they're just demure or they're just you know a quiet girl. Or if they talk too much, then, oh, you're just a chatty girl. In the same respect, I think when it comes to the LGBTQ plus community, and I say this as a cisgender heterosexual male, uh, I think a lot of times their needs aren't taken seriously, or a lot of times they are dismissed be simply because they're autistic, or their identity is dismissed because how could they know what they want if they're autistic? Uh, but I think once again, their needs to be uh, deserve to be taken seriously, or what their desires and what their plans are should be taken seriously and should be taken at face value. Uh, on top of that, I think the other thing to remember is that um, misdiagnosis and a lack of diagnosis has a cost. Plenty of girls who get diagnosed later have difficulty with eating disorders or have trouble with um, interpersonal violence later on. And that's not to blame the girls. It's to say that uh, if you don't understand how you move through the world and how you're disabled, that can lead to people, really bad people taking advantage of you. And on top of that, uh, with many people of color who get misdiagnosed uh, or undiagnosed, that can lead to really terrible interactions with law enforcement. Uh, it can lead to incarceration. Yeah, so some of those um, last couple of points um, also came up in our book chat last month on Sincerely Your Autistic Child, which I will also link in the chat. So let's look at a couple of additional quotes from the book. Mr. Garcia says, um, we don't know what autism in and of itself looks like. We only know how autism informed by trauma presents itself. And I think that, that, uh, that comes up in almost every book chat we ever do here. He goes on to say, autistic people's value and worth should not be tied to whether they are employable. It doesn't matter if an autistic person holds a high paying job or receives government assistance. Autistic people should be viewed with the same dignity that all people deserve. Um, and um, that was also, I remember uh, that, that, that came up in multiple of the essays in Sincerely Your Autistic Child that we looked at last month. And I think that when we think about all of the um, all of the isms, um, you know, the intersection of ableism and capitalism and all of the really harmful messages that tell people that their value comes from what they produce. Um, 
that is really bad for health. Here's another excerpt. If there's going to be a policy that has seismic impacts on their lives, they deserve to have a say in it, no matter how they communicate. Furthermore, while many parent advocates, clinicians, and other quote experts may have good intentions, centering their voices continues to give them power that should lie with, with the autistic community. To achieve any true sense of freedom, autistic people need to take this power back. Um, that reminds me, it's, it's, uh, we're, we're short staffed today. It reminds me of a brain club that we did in January. Um, yeah, I'm going to read Liz's comment. Um, Liz says it feels validating to see a high profile journalist naming all of these issues in a grounded and authoritative way. Absolutely. Could not agree more. Um, this sentiment of nothing about us without us, um, which is um, a really important core message of the self-advocacy movement. Um, this came up um, in um, our Bring Club in January, a vision of inclusive community where our panelists um, from uh, local Vermont leaders talking about vision for inclusion. And I remember that um, uh, our, our representatives, um, Max and Hassan from Green Mountain Self Advocates talked about that concept a lot. Martha says it also helps to have someone with such good writing skills make these powerful points so clearly. Absolutely, definitely, so true. So I'm gonna connect these truths um, with another book. So Sanja Menon is an autistic ADHD psychologist based in Australia. Um, Sanja is the author of several books, um, including *The Brain Forest* and *The Rainbow Brain*. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna watch. Uh, so it's Sanja joined us as a presenter um, asynchronously last year, and we're gonna watch the video of Sanja um, uh, being interviewed for Brain Club and reading um, her book *The Rainbow Brain* to us, and we'll listen to her. Um, I, I could summarize why she wrote the book, but we'll listen to her talk about why she wrote the book. Um, but Sanja is a, um, a psychologist and educator um, who provides neuroaffirming accessible information for kids and families and professionals. And um, I will think, Sierra, that's great. Um, I'm going to just also put in the chat. So this is Sanja Menon's website where you can also access the book. And I'll also put her, um, her Instagram account in the chat as well. And she has a lot of really great content. Stinky garbage coming through. Ow. What's Stinky garbage coming through. Hold on. Okay. There we go. So let's watch this video. So I would just, I would love to just hear your story. A lot of stories. Of, so many stories. I have a storyteller, but I can go round and round. So. <laughs> Don't we all? Um, yes, I know. So I'll start. Um, I'm going to start at the beginning because that's... Yeah, wait. <laughs> that is the very way to start the story. <laughs> from, the, from the beginning of time. <laughs> <laughs> um so I guess I got into psychology because I had a really hard incident happen to me when I was 11 um I had a cousin who drowned and died I was so was pronounced brain dead but then we kept him on life support and you know we've continued going which is wonderful um but it was a really really hard point in my life um because I was 11, he was 18 months, so I was kind of looking after him. It was like that beautiful, like, maternal cousin kind of vibe. <laughs> um, and that's when I had a lot of emotions and decided I wanted to be a child psychologist because I went to the library, I read all about emotions, what is going on with my body. <laughs> um, so that's what started me on this journey of 
wanting to help other children just understand what emotions are because I've been there. I understand how messy and complex that is. Um, what got me into the field of autism was another cousin of mine um, was dying, not diagnosed, but very autistic <laughs> um, and recognized ADHD. Uh, and we were very close. And so I was like, well, I kind of get it. Like I, I know what this is like. So I started, you know, when I was trying to get more experience, I started in the field of autism. I stayed there because I was happy. I got it. Um, and it was just such a great field to be in. And that landed into my eventual autism identification. <laughs> um, ADHD came first for me. I'm very like ADHD forward. Um, and interestingly, once I was medicated, that's when like more autistic traits started coming out. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of overwhelm because I'm like, wow, look, I can focus now. I can definitely do all the things. <laughs> um, and that led to a lot of sensory overwhelm and burnout. Um, and then I landed up at autism identification. One of the things that, you know, I'm really passionate about is making sure that we don't have to get there, right? I was at a point where I was just not even functioning in order to get my identification. Like I was throwing up from sensory, like input. I was autistic all along, <laughs> but it was just not recognized. And so, you know, we need to do more in our field to recognize happy autistics. <laughs> um you know when we're just like stimming with joy and now i you know i advocate really strongly for the next generation seeing my son you know if i we, we had this thing i don't know if you've got it but where you drop the vitamins into the water it comes as a little tablet and it fizzes and to see him go ah! <laughs> you know and just like really happy stims and understanding autistic joy is really nice um so i yeah that's one of the things that I do now oh, and managed to summarize my whole journey not too badly <laughs> first of all I just want to acknowledge like like just I, the, the unthinkable trauma that that you went through and how you tra transformed that to be able to to be making such an impact on the lives of children um that's just Ah, I just want to acknowledge, acknowledge all, all, all of that. My goodness. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So in, uh, I'm from Singapore and like how our family operates is you treat like your cousins as like your siblings, right? Mm -hmm. So who I consider my immediate family, like he's part of that. Um, and you know, at family dinners, just to see him like screaming and crying and not really understanding why, because we had no access to his inner world back then. Yeah. So it was years. So I think he only got AAC when he was 16 years old. And the accident was when he was 18 months. <laughs> that was a really, really long time of, I don't know, I'm just going to try to figure it out. It was very messy and muddy. And, you know, that's kind of how I grew up, us just trying to work it out, trying to be curious about what's going on. Um, we weren't sure <laughs> so now you know i work with a lot of distressed behaviors and i'm like we get it <laughs> yes yes yeah yeah and i i could not agree more i mean dsm criteria for autism are autistic stress behaviors i'm like what would this look like to actually for someone to be able to figure out their true self before reaching like such profound states of dysregulation yes i know wouldn't that be lovely <laughs> Um, uh, as as a psychologist, do you interface with colleagues from the old way? Like, do you like do you, or or have you like steered clear and you just do your own thing? I always think you know, I am really happy to chat if you're open to learning. I'm not open to having an argument. If you want to, you know, <laughs> argue with me on that and not take on the information that I'm presenting. Then that's a waste of my time. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Who I am really open to is people who have 
heard a little bit about, you know, what a neuroaffirming approach is, acknowledge that it is challenging and are ready to ask their questions. And then I'm really happy to answer them and like to support them and try to identify, hang on, where's that niggly bit for you and how can I change that? Um, I'm really happy to do that. And I'm actually doing that in October, which is fun. So this is the story of uh, your becoming a clinician. Um, what's the story of you becoming an author? <laughs> uh, that is a really fun story. That is, you know, ADHD at the helm. Um, I just saw, I literally just had a client come in and ask me a question. And that question really niggled at me. <laughs> She said, some of my classmates don't understand, you know, my client, or some of his classmates don't understand him. Can you recommend a book for him to get up to the front of the class and talk to everyone about his diagnosis? And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> um, no, I can't do it that. It doesn't exist. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it exists. Resources like those exist. No, but, but they're not good. They're, they're not the messages that you would want to be out there to the class. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some, some of them are good, but it's just so my niggly bit is I don't think a disabled kid should have to, first of all, share his diagnosis if he doesn't want to, simply because it is bred out of ignorance of his classmates. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, and I think, you know, if he wants to share his diagnosis, he can. But it shouldn't be a mandatory thing. It shouldn't be, I have to tell you about my autism in right. order for you to be understanding and inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, I think inclusion should be at the very heart of our education. And we Amen. can support everybody to understand. I think, you know, on a classroom educational level, we should be talking about these differences and how they exist to make our classroom stronger. Yes. Amen. Um, yeah. So I would love, I would love to know um, how, when you talk about inclusion, um, what does inclusion mean to you? Yeah. Um, really good question. <laughs> um, and I saw, I saw a quote recently that really, really struck at me. It's, I think belonging is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. And I don't think that's right. Um, so <laughs> because, you know, if you think about that party scenario, um, you can be asked to dance to it and they're like, wow, and I think this is what we're doing, right? We're saying, well, we're asking you along, we're including you, but we're not paying attention to the fact that you know, maybe it's still too loud. Maybe the party is actually still unwelcoming. Maybe I'm in overload. And so we do these basic things that go, well, I've asked you, I've made these things available, but we don't look at the barriers to accessing them. Amen. So I, I would argue that inclusion is being part of the planning. Yes. Um, right? It's having a say in how the party is conducted in the first place. Um, yeah, so getting to look at, okay, well, where are the safe zones? You know, um, how do I make sure that I have access to the things that help me? How can I make sure that, you know, the music's not too loud? Um, or, you know, go through periods where I feel safer. Those kinds of things, I feel like that is true inclusion. When we invite disabled people to have a say at the table, and for it to well and truly be had, right? Amen. I am a, yeah, I'm a pediatric psych and I hear a lot of, well, we have a safe space in the back or we have fidgets in the room, like, but that's not, that's not it. Um, you can't just say, well, we have fidgets. Check, it's um, box checking. Exactly. Um, and, but if the child accesses the fidgets, they're made fun of, or, you know, Right. Because we don't have that fundamental layer of everyone is safe enough to use these accommodations yeah. to, you know, that attitude change needs to be present first, not just the, the boxes and the things. They, they hadn't changed 
their view of the world, which is that there's no right way to be a person. And if you like normalize that for four year olds, like what a world we would have. Yeah. I know one of the things I really love about this book, and I don't know if you know, um, Yale Clark, um, she emceed my, the launch of my brain first. And, you know, she read the book for the first time and she said, this book isn't just for children, Sandy. You know, this book was so healing for me to read. And, you know, what I love about them is they are just a really simple English way of kind of boiling down what we know in research, what we know in community conversations to something that's easy to read. It's quick. It's colorful and pretty which I clearly like <laughs> um and you know it's just a way of bringing joy and that's one of the things I really wanted to do with these books is make something cool you know and just not you know I didn't want to just like fiver it and have the book exist <laughs> you know and I said it had to be looking good so people could actually have a resource that they were really proud of um, so I realized that when I read this book, it's going to be like mirrored. I don't know if you can change that, but anyway, I'll read it out so you can see the pictures. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm glad that that works. So this is the Rainbow <laughs> Brain. It, what it does is talk about autism and ADHD together in the same brain because, you know, so I wrote the brain for us first when I was just identified as an ADHD and then by the time it launched autism came into the picture um but I wrote it as an ADHD -er. and then when I was identified autistic I was like Whoo! you know I don't know how these rules come together <laughs> that's really tricky and I thought you know what if if I have difficulty knowing you know which side like is autism dominant what things I do that are ADHD dominant and how I marry those two together, um, kids would have the same difficulty. So that's what made the rainbow brain. <laughs> but I'll read it. I feel very much like this is story time, everybody. <laughs> I love it. Um, great. Um, so actually, I want to read the dedication. It says, to all the amazing ADHDers who have told me that they have rainbow brains, this, this book was named by you and is for you. Thank you for always guiding me. So what, what a lot of children did after they read the brain first is they identified with so many things on different pages that they finished it and said, I have a rainbow brain. And I go, well, this is clearly... <laughs> the next best you know it had to follow this is your rainbow brain so while the brain first is just talking about neurodiversity in general um the rainbow brain especially for our neurodivergent people to see their brain represented um okay so i'll actually start reading <laughs> i have a lot of side quests in my brain okay <laughs> So deep down in the brain forest, I found a tree that looks like mine. It wasn't like any brain I'd seen. It had colours that swirled to combine. Let me see. It's actually here. So it's not just one solid colour. It's got a few colours going on. This tree was a sight to behold with beautiful shades of blue. But all mixed in with that, there was some fiery red too fiery red this swirling whirling tree is called autism and adhd those are names for what it's like to have a brain like me um, and then you see over here it's, it's adhd and autism together blue and red peanut butter and jam butter and bread mint and lamb Yes. Will they work together? Amazingly, they just do. Can we know them as one rather than as two? Peanut butter and jam was like my favourite sandwich combination. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, he goes, purple. We could be wonderful together and come to know this dance of how two seemingly opposing ideas can work perfectly given the chance. Now we're going to some rules. So autism. I like to know what's coming up. I feel great when things are the same. I plan all the smallest details to keep stress out of my brain. And then we have ADHD. I like life to be interesting and new. I feel bored when things are the same. <laughs> details can matter or get tossed aside. Doing, doing what I feel is my aim. How do we marry those two together? <laughs> and, you know, in the rainbow brain, I can deal with change unless a surprise you spring. Given choice, control, and time, I'm happy to do new things. And this is the ADHD network brain representing. It's lovely. Um, so ADHD, my brain likes to go fast and do lots at the same time. <laughs> A little of this, a bit of that. How I get things done is mine to define. So talking about affirming executive function skills. Right, we have a different way of getting it done. And then we have autism, like and that's represented kind of more sequentially, like a cog. And it says my brain needs to go slow. It takes its time to think. There are so many facts gathered to collect process and sync. So he's really talking about that detail orientation. Uh, which I love this little magnifying glass. <laughs> um, so ADHD and autism. I learn best with preferred topics. My interest determines my speed. <laughs> when is boring though, I multitask to meet my needs. So we see, you know, a child jumping on a trampoline, um, a spin, a fidget. So it's just kind of nice to have like an ADHD culture represented in books. Um, okay. And so this is the autism page. It says, my brain does not filter, taking in most sights and sounds. Being in nature is lovely, but I need help in busy surrounds. So we say, you know, turn down the lights. We can use noise cancelling headphones, or we can, you know, advocate and ask to meet in a quiet space. So you know, come with me. I can't go there, but you can come here. And ADHD, my brain thinks everything is important. <laughs> I pay attention to it all. <laughs> it's easy to forget what is said. I use strategies to help my recall. One instruction at a time. Sit closer to the teacher or I make it visual. I draw and write it down. Um, and this is one of my favorites. Um, this is talking about our emotions. <laughs> it's just kind of, you know, all the high highs and news, but the yes and the smileys, but also just the hang on, we need to slow down. We need to just go <laughs> um, So, this is the best way that I can represent our emotions. Um, we engage the world with the world so deeply. Our highs are high, our lows are low. However, I am feeling, I allow myself. I learnt to go with the flow. So, really thinking about our compassion for ourselves and accepting where we are. Um, now these colours are swirling to get that are swirling work together. Don't you see? Want to know another little secret? There may be more colours in your tree. <laughs> um, and then we have this, the real rainbow brain. You know, let's talk about ARFID and intellectual disability and anxiety and PDA and Tourette's and OCD and giftedness and, you know, all our learning um, calendars. So dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, dyspraxia. You know, talking about it's not just autism and ADHD, it's very rarely occurring by itself. Um, but let's learn to look at ourselves more holistically. Um, this is, there are so many different trees and a few of them are rainbow. 
but yeah, we kind of come back to that brain first concept of, you know, this is dyslexia, there's neurotypical brains, there's people who are just autistic or ADHD, and then we've got our rainbow brain. We've kind of added those few more colors in there now. I'm learning more about my brain type and with the right supports, I grow. So here are some people that help nurture rainbow brains. This one, we're talking about why we see people. Okay, so we have our parents, we have an occupational therapist, we have counsellors, animal therapists, we have our teachers, psychologists, that's me. <laughs> um, you know, we have support workers who might come, um, speech pathologists, or art therapists. So really trying to represent you know, some of the people who we might see. Um, talking about here are some things that can hurt rainbow brains. Loud noises, bright lights, too many things to concentrate on, having to sit still for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> I'm fidgety, I need to move. Um, a sudden changes, rejection, feeling misunderstood, and ignoring our body signs. Actually being made to really <laughs> um, and yeah some things that help rainbow brains so we we have like self-advocacy I need to play by myself today it's okay sure I'll see you later right. and you know just having that connection because this is something that I used to do at school I never played with my friends all the time but they always got that we were still friends I, I like to do my own thing a lot of the time Right, so here are some things that help rainbow brains. Resting when we need. Um, my son came up to me the other day and said, well, I'm feeling very tired because it's the first week of school and I need to cancel my <laughs> after school activities. <laughs> I'm like, great. <laughs> I love that you're telling me this and articulating it. <laughs> um, sensory accommodations. So using what we need. We have safe and same foods. And I had to draw chicken nuggets <laughs> in this. I'm like, this is ADHD culture. I love nuggets. And it like, actually says, I love nuggets. <laughs> I do love nuggets. <laughs> I'm asking for what we need, learning about ourselves, time in nature, time with our interests, and meeting others with rainbow brains. This is all my recommendations usually in reports. And I really wanted to give a nod to, you know, we can celebrate rainbow brains, but at the same time, talk about how it is a disability and it is really hard. Um, so I depicted it this way. It says, having a rainbow brain is special, but the world can be hard to navigate. See, it wasn't built for rainbow brains. There are still changes we need to create. It's tiring moving through this world and we need more time to rest. Making space for self-care and the things we love help us feel at our best. So, chilling out. <laughs> um, because now we know, oh, so happy. <laughs> um, now we know what works for the rainbow brain design. Go build a wonderful life and shine, shine, shine. And that's it. And then I've just kind of got some other terms and further reading if anyone wants to learn more about it. That's the rainbow brain. I don't even know what to say. Like, I just feel so incredibly honored to have, to have you read this to me. Like, it's one thing for me to have like, read it on my own but to have you read it to me like this is like i think i like this is anyway i just anyway like but people people want to reduce down to like well this is my autism and this is my adhd anyway like this was just such a beautiful like even like the the the, the, the metaphor of color like of course red and blue can become purple of course they can like ah. and, yeah and, and I appreciate like all of the little details that went in 
to just even even what you chose to show as images um, for these concepts. Just just I am I am blown away. This is this is just beyond anything. This is incredible. <laughs> Thank you. That's so nice. I'm so happy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, that's very kind of you. You know, I like whenever I create in this little room, um, it's just looking at how we represent our culture. And it's so, so nice when that kind of lands with someone else too. All I think about is, you know, first of all, me. Like, what do I love? I love nuggets. I love fidgets. And, you know, <laughs> and then kind of putting that in place. Like, so the end product is something that I'm really, really happy with. And when someone else sees that as well, they're like, oh, I love nuggets too. I was like, you have no idea how much I love nuggets. <laughs> I love nuggets so much. Yes. I know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, cool. I was going through a really tough year last year with um, sensory input, particularly around food. And, you know, I would have food cooked for me, so I couldn't even cook, but I would have food cooked for me and it would be, you know, a balanced meal. And I'd look at it and I just couldn't eat it. And mm. my husband would look at me and now he's learned without judgment to just go, do you need nuggets? <laughs> just so you can eat, you know? And I'm like, thank you so much because I can't handle this right now. I know that, you know, this food provides nutrients and nutrition, but right now I need to eat what I can eat. Um, it. And it's not that plate. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, uh, my husband hasn't figured that out yet, um, but uh, yeah. yes, that resonates with me a lot. Right. Yeah, yeah. I love um, the nuggets of bringing us together. <laughs> it is good. Yeah, um, I had a so my my follow up to nuggets is uh, is is French fries, and so mm -hmm. that's that that was my dinner tonight. So it was uh, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. Um, can I sure can I tell you a little bit about my favorite chip? I have to. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. Sorry. There is this um, a chain in Australia that exists. I don't know outside, but it is. They've thought about their chip design so much, and it's actually it's not square. It is diamond shaped, so that the inside is fluffy and the outside like crisp. It's like I love it. I said you have like thought scientifically about how to create the perfect chip, and the seasoning is so good. Oh, that's amazing. Like, well, that's too. so interesting. You're making me think about like the physics of chip design, which I'd never thought about. Like that's why waffle fries are so much easier to cook. Mm -hmm. Whoa. <laughs> um, this is amazing. Um, amazing. The science of our food. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious what um, how old is your child before I ask? I was going to ask you, like, what, what, what does your child think of your books? Oh, six. Are, um, are children the same age? Yeah. Um, so he actually helped me create the brain for us when he was four, which is amazing because, you know, it was created in lockdown and I had him by my feet. <laughs> I go, well, I really need to try and get this out. Why don't you draw this idea? And he drew the first sketches and I just sent those sketches to my graphic designer as it turned this into something. And it's nice to see the translation. Um, yeah, no, he's very proud of me. He Shortly after I learned that I was autistic, I, I, I too, um, ADHD came first and then, um, uh, you know, and anyway, um, so, um, drove myself into burnout. Um, and was also like, I also had this, I had a job that was really ruining my life and that further drove me into burnout and, um, you know, all of that anyway. So, um, got really bad, had a, I'd never, I mean, I'm, I'm more of a, I'm a meltdown dysregulated person, not a shutdown. And I reached a point of dysregulation I had never reached before. And I lost the ability to speak. I didn't leave my chair and like didn't leave my room. Anyway, it was like a big, anyway. And then finally, thank God for my rainbow brain um, that I conceived of my nonprofit organization. And that was what pulled me out. And, um, 
it was uh, um, a, 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 a big scramble. To... And then my then four-year-old was also sitting at my feet. And I gave her uh, the outline of a brain, like to like color, like just color while I'm like researching electronic medical records and stuff. And this is what she made. Oh, that's lovely. It's very pretty. <laughs> Thank you. So she colored a rainbow brain, which we drew a house around and we made it our logo. Um, but I so appreciate, I just, I, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to hear, to hear your story and your journey. And thank you for sharing your beautiful book, not just with me, but with the world. It's so incredible. I mean, this is, I mean, when you, when you, when you think about the opportunity, I mean, like when, when you said that people, adults have shared with you that reading the brain forest was healing. I mean, that this even even I spend my whole day thinking about the marriage of autism and ADHD um even for me um I have new insights that I about my own brain that I didn't have until <laughs> you said it so anyway um yeah. thank you thank you so much so delightful so thank you, everyone. Um, as we wrap up today, I'm going to pass the mic to Sierra. Thanks, Mel. Um, I agree. This is I both those book clubs were some of my favorite book clubs we've done, and some of my favorite um, conversations we've had. And I think that I think that both of those conversations together kind of really center around the idea of normalizing all types of brains and that there's no one right way to have a brain. There's no one right way to have a body. There's no one right way to think. Um, there's nothing broken about much anybody's brain. Um, and that through learning about our own brain and learning what to ask for for other people and learning how to advocate for our needs and finding community with other people, that's, that's how we function as I think we're just talking about that's how we that's how we function in a world that's not necessarily built for our brain or not built for our for our body I think that's that's the case for a lot of different identities and different types of discriminated identities and disabilities um finding community is is the way that we that we that we push through that and that the way that we find that we can we can do this and we can make a world that works for our brains and not just not just survive but thrive ideally a beautiful message to 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 wrap us up thank you sierra and thank all of you for being here tonight and being part of brain club as a reminder um that uh brain club will be um on on uh pause for the month of September. If you're not yet on our mailing list, I'm going to put the link in the chat. Um, the schedule and registration link for October will go out in the September newsletter. We'll just go out in a couple of weeks. Um, so uh, we'll we'll look forward to uh, seeing you back um, when Brain Club resumes on uh, Tuesday, October 1st. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Martha. And thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Bye.